to know what I know. Your father was a stone mace. Is that pleasing to you? Yes, it is. But he was more than that. He was a visionary. What did he see? That kings have a need of their subjects, no less than their subjects have need of kings. A dangerous idea. Your father was a philosopher. He had a way of speaking that took you by the ears and by the heart. None of those things can be written down, Robin. You must commit them to your very soul. This is the science of memory. Rise and rise again until lambs become lions. <laughs> Finally, hundreds, listen, thousands. We took up his call for the rights of all ranks, from baron to son. Rise and rise again. Until lambs become lions. Welcome everyone to this episode of Beyond the Crucible, the podcast that dares to talk about setback and failure, but not so we can commiserate, so we can elevate. I'm Gary Schneeberger, the co-host of the show, and our mission today is to offer you the hope that your crucible experiences, those tragedies and challenges you faced or are facing right now, do not define you. They refine you. They didn't happen to you. They happened for you. And I don't know many people who know that better than the host of the show, the founder of Crucible Leadership my friend and a true expert in the subject that we're going to be talking about today. And that is Warwick Fairfax. Warwick, I know this, uh, th the subject of this episode, our conversation today is an important one to you, one that you've loved since you were a child. So. Absolutely, Gary. Uh, really excited for this episode. Um, yeah, this should be a lot of fun. Well, the reason why, listener, this is going to be a lot of fun is that this is part of our series, Lights, Camera, Crucibles, what your favorite movie heroes can teach you about overcoming setback and failure. And this week's exploration is on a subject, on a, on a movie hero that means, that has meant a lot to Warwick um, since uh, he was a boy, as uh, we'll talk about here. And I'm, before I say said character's name, I'm just going to do this so you can see <laughs> you can see who we might be talking about today, Warwick. There you go. Um, it is indeed <laughs> it is indeed Robin Hood. That's why I've got an arrow here on my jacket, and that's why if you're listening, not watching on YouTube, you have no idea why we just laughed. Um, I, I've put a Robin Hood, a Robin Hood felt hat on my head. So I'm very commonly wear hats uh, on the show. Uh, I will not wear this one the whole episode of the war because it'll probably distract you. So I'll take it off now, <laughs> but, but there it goes. So that was my way of, uh, of making sure I was on brand here for our discussion of Robin Hood. Um, so the reason that we chose Robin Hood listeners is um, one of the things that we try to do with every every hero that we select is what are the key learnings from the movie experience of that hero that apply to what crucible leadership aims to help you to do. And that is to overcome your setbacks and failures and lead a life of significance. And Robin Hood is, is a great example of that. And I'm going to, going to throw out a couple of like biographical notes and then I'm going to let Warwick sort of explain a little more about, about it. But Robin Hood, as you all know, right? If if you know only a little of him, he's the guy who who takes from the rich and gives to the poor, um, and he's a legendary heroic outlaw depicted originally in English folklore and then subsequently featured in a lot of literature and a lot of film. According to legend, he was a highly skilled archer and swordsman. In some versions of the legends, he's depicted as being of noble birth. In some modern versions, he's depicted as being a yeoman. Uh, but some of the general beats that are there for all of them is he's he's uh, he's taken part in the Crusades, 
or he served King Richard, who was running the Crusades. And um, he's he's often dressed in this hat that I was just wearing. Um, and but it's that idea of fighting for the oppressed and helping them become less oppressed, I think, is a is is sort of the headline of who Robin Hood is. If we had to nail it down to a tweet. Right. Or. Absolutely. Yeah. He's always uh, fighting for the common man, the common woman. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, there's uh, obviously different adaptations um, kind of originally in the earliest myths dating to, you know, 11, 1200s and beyond, he was sort of this uh, yeoman, common man uh, figure. And then in later versions, and I don't know, 1600s through 1800s, uh, he becomes a noble, I guess, because the writers of uh, mythical fiction back then uh, wanted him more to be this heroic noble figure. So, yeah, it's there have been different versions of him, but... Um, uh, he's this uh, mythic person that fights for the oppressed against uh, the rich and powerful. And that's one of the things that I've I've found really interesting about it is because I I have not been a huge Robin Hood fan my whole life. Um, he he is big in America as well, but not certainly not as big as perhaps in in England and Australia. Um, uh, but I sort of always assumed at some point in my life I forget when I stopped assuming this that he was like based on a real life figure. And that has been something that historians have tried to prove over the years, but they've never been able to do it, have they? That Robin Hood was actually based on one person who actually existed. No, it is really a uh, a mythic, heroic uh, figure. And um, it's just fascinating, as I guess we'll get into, is just the, the different versions of him uh, in film have, have changed a bit. But we'll get into this 2010 Russell Crowe movie we're going to chat about a lot here. Uh, if anything, that's more of the original story uh, of, of Robin Hood. But um, the the mythic figure I grew up with um, is really, um, you know, typified in the 1938 movie with Errol Flynn uh, as Robin Hood, Olivia de Havilland as Maid Marian uh, with the adventures of Robin Hood. And so right. that's sort of the classic version that uh, pre-Russell Crowe, uh, even the Kevin Costner version, that is the what today people commonly think of as Robin Hood. You know, he's this nobleman that uh, goes off to the Crusades, at least in some of them. He um, kind of comes back. Uh, King Richard is captured somewhere in uh, Austria, I think it is, and is held for ransom for years. And so Robin is uh, back in back in England, <clears throat> but because he opposes then Prince John and his tyranny, he is get you know becomes an outlaw. So you have this nobleman who basically gives up his title, if you will, by fighting for the oppressed. And you know at the end of the uh, 1938 movie, King Richard comes back and all is restored and everything's good. So that's the that is the classic. Uh, tale, be it in Kevin Costner's version or in uh, Errol Flynn's version, wealthy nobleman basically, in a sense, puts everything on the line to fight for the oppressed, but at the end right. he has it restored anyway. That's that's the normal version, if you will, uh, in the last, I don't know, you know, 80, 90 years of the, of the Robin Hood myth. And it's interesting to hear, to hear you explain it that way, because we say often at Crucible Leadership and Beyond the Crucible that success and significance aren't mutually exclusive. Um, you can have success and that success can be, you know, also part of a life of significance. What's interesting, as I hear you describe Robin Hood in that way, um, he, in the traditional reading of the Errol Flynn film and the, and the Kevin Costner film, um, he sort of had to cast significance, I mean, cast success aside to find significance. Uh, he he wasn't one who initially was able to to meld those two together. He had to he had to leave behind success. He had to become an outlaw, and then through that and helping the oppressed, he he found significance. And as you said, it's restored. But that's an interesting concept. There's not a whole lot of times we talk about that on this show that success and significance don't exist in the same universe. 
in the universe of Robin Hood, many times that's true. Su- success as the world defines it and significance do not coexist. Yeah. I mean, sometimes you have to be willing to risk it all for, uh, for the greater good. And <clears throat> really, every version of Robin Hood that's popular, it's never about him. In the 1938 classic version with Errol Flynn, not only does he want to you know, rob from the, the rich, the oppressive King John, who was imposing ridiculously high taxes to just to benefit his own wealth and coffers, uh, but also he wants to help raise money to free uh, King Richard in Austria, you know, help raise ransom money. There's a wonderful scene in the 1938 movie with Errol Flynn as Robin Hood and uh, Olivia de Havilland as Maid Marian, when he's trying to explain to her in you know, the Sherwood Forest what it is they do. And they've just plundered a whole bunch of stuff, you know, uh, taxes from some you know, wealthy uh, henchman of, King, of, of Prince John, and he asks his men, so men, should we divide up all this money, the spoils for ourselves, or should we use it to ransom King Richard in prison in Austria? What do we do, men? And they all sh- shout, this is for King Richard. In other words, mm. they, they could have used the money for themselves, but none of his men were about themselves. It's all about combating oppression and freeing their beloved King Richard, who wasn't perfect, but certainly was a way better king than uh, than. Than, than Prince John, so uh, yeah, certainly yeah. better than his brother turned out to be. For oh sure. my! In every every version, Prince John and then King John is is, is the bad guy, which was yeah. true in real life. Sort of like um, uh, Guy Gisborne as the sheriff, yeah. right? I mean, he he he's he's a bad guy uh, in in all the versions as well. Speaking of all the versions, um, you have have talked a little bit here about the 1938 with Errol Flynn. We're going to really unpack the the, uh, 2010 with Russell Crowe, but it all kind of begins filmically in 1922 with with, um, Douglas Fairbanks. And that is an interesting film because not only does it set Robin Hood on its on his filmic journey, but it's sort of the start, you could argue, of, of action heroes. Uh, uh, you and I were talking beforehand here and you said that, um, you know, Bruce Willis and Arnold Schwarzenegger and Sylvester Stallone all owe a little bit of a debt of gratitude to uh, D- uh, Douglas Fairbanks. How so? Yeah, absolutely. So the original 1922 version starring Douglas Fairbanks, I mean, he did an early silent movie version of Zorro and, you know, pirate swashbuckling movies. He was the original action hero swashbuckler that everybody from Errol Flynn onward owe a debt of gratitude. I mean, back in the 20s, he was the box office gold. Everybody wanted to see the, the, the latest swashbuckling you know, Douglas Fairbanks, action hero. He was married to uh, another movie star, uh, Mary Pickford. And arguably, you could say they created Hollywood. You know, back in the early 20s, it wasn't a whole lot out there. And with their movies, and, you know, they built this big house pick fair somewhere in, I don't know, Beverly Hills, Hollywood, somewhere like that. It just became a magnet. So, uh, yeah, Douglas Fairbanks was huge in many ways, both in terms of helping to create the Hollywood that we now have, as well as just the original, uh, the original origin story, the action hero. So an amazing guy. And it, you know, all this that we've been kind of talking about, let's gather it up here and, and, and put it in perspective for the listeners. And that what about, you know, what makes Robin Hood so timeless and ageless, why he's still around uh, these 80, 90 years, I can't do the math, is because of what he inspires in us, the the viewers, right? Uh, and that's to live a life on purpose dedicated to serving others. If there was a logo for that aspect of what Crucible Leadership stands for, um, Robin Hood's a pretty good logo for that, isn't it? A life on purpose dedicated to serving others. Absolutely. And in the Robin Hood myth and every version, putting everything on the line for your beliefs. You know, it's almost like in the military, they say in the US, duty on a country, people are, go in the military knowing they may well have to risk their lives for their country. It's in one sense, you could say the ultimate noble sacrifice, you know, to, um, and, you know, in this particular case, in the Robin Hood uh, era, uh, he is 
willing to lay down his life to combat forces of oppression, in this uh, case led by Prince and then King John. And it's not about his own wealth, irrespective of the version, whether he's a yeoman, common man in the 2010 right. Russell Crowe version or Kevin Costner, uh, Errol Flynn version, where he's more of a wealthy uh, nobleman. It's all about putting everything on the line, not just for a cause, but for a cause that's devoted to helping other people. Right. That, in a sense, is the ultimate life of significance and that um, you were willing to risk everything to help others for a higher purpose, for a life right. of significance. That's, sort of, that's why it's such a compelling story and why people have been fascinated by uh, the story of um, Robin Hood uh, for you know, years, if not uh, centuries. And one of the things that's interesting about it, and, and we're going to get into talking now about the the, the uh, Russell Crowe 2010 version, but <clears throat> sort of the, to, to set the table for that, one of the things I thought I found fascinating about looking through all these movies um, that have been based on the Robin Hood legend have drawn their inspiration from that is that uh, this this movie, this 2010 movie, you're exactly right. It, it, it's lasted through generations and each generation has sort of gotten its own kind of Robin Hood. Um, I liken it to as I was watching this movie for this show, I, I, it made me think of James Bond. And I just so happen to be, aside from the work I do at, at Crucible Leadership here, I'm writing a book on the films of James Bond. And I've watched from Sean Connery through then Daniel Craig. And what happens is Sean Connery's kind of, you know, a, a rake, right? He's kind of, you know, he's, he's kind of charming and he's witty. And Daniel Craig is, is, is you know, gritty and, and violent and, and, and really strong and powerful. And the same sort of thing can be said about the early Robin Hoods and then to this 2010 with Russell Crowe. It's kind of like, um, like Dan, like Daniel Craig's version of Bond, Russell Crowe's version of Robin Hood is very much for its time today. Um, he's uh, he's he's not, you know, if it were if it were um, uh, it wouldn't be boxing, right? Boxing is described as a sweet science, right? That's Errol Flynn's Robin Hood, I think. Um, Russell Crowe's is MMA, mixed martial arts. It's it's it, it's much more physical and much more gritty. Um, but yet the the importance again for our discussion is that the the beats of the story about dedicating your life to serve others and rising above crucibles is is, is a through line through all of these uh, these iterations of it. Um, uh, so. The movie begins, the 2010 Robin Hood begins with a, with a fantastic preamble. Uh, the preamble says this, in times of tyranny and injustice, when law oppresses the people, the outlaw takes his place in history. Um, this movie takes place as most of the Robin Hood legends do um, in 12th century England. Um, that's a pretty good summary of what we're about to see in this movie, and frankly, what we see in all the Robin Hood uh, depictions, most of them. Exactly. It's all about Robin Hood as being this champion for the underdog in uh, fighting against tyranny and injustice. I mean, sadly, tyranny and injustice have been around ever since they were humans. It's the nature of humans that there will be some that choose to oppress, even enslave others. And it's true of most, if not every culture. And it was certainly true in, uh, in 12th century England, as we'll see later. The rights of kings back then was pretty much absolute. They could do whatever right. they wanted, whenever they wanted, pretty much no rules. You know, none of this Marquis of Queensby rule stuff, like in boxing they had. I mean, it's like... You're the king. Uh, at the risk of being slightly humorous, I'm reminded of that uh, Mel Brooks movie. I think it's History of the World Part Two or something. Some right. I, I don't think it ever was a part one, but it just started with part two. Right. And there's a scene where um, King Louis the France says, "It's good to be the king," you know. Yeah. yeah. And it's kind of like that, you know. It's humorous in a way. It's good to be the king. You could do, you know, you could do whatever you wanted. Bad for everybody else. Uh, but these were dark times. 
And speaking of Mel Brooks, one of the, even he did a Robin Hood <laughs> uh, movie, Robin Hood Men in Tights, yeah. uh, which was a comedy, which is, is, is funny in that, in that Mel Brooks kind of way. I'm going to do something I haven't done in, in the series yet, because you just have been talking about um, uh, Kings and absolute power. Um, and our next episode is going to be on Spider-Man. And there's a key beat in the Spider-Man story. Um, it varies from, from movie to movie on who tells it to him, but Spider-Man lives on with this, this belief uh, birth from a crucible birth from pain that with great power comes great responsibility. And that is um, what we're not seeing in, in, in the, in the bad guys in Robin hood, they have a lot of power. Uh, many of the, you know, the, the rulers, um, but they're not living it responsibly. And that's where Robin, as he develops power, he continues to live responsibly. He starts out with no power living responsibly. And as he, as he, as he begins to become a hero, um, he he doesn't lose that that sense of responsibility. Um, the basic beats of this story uh, in Robin Hood 2010, King Richard the Lionheart, it, he's been away for a decade fighting his crucible. Uh, sorry, his crucible. That's really funny. I'm so, uh, same letters, fighting his crusade. He's fighting his crusade uh, and he's away for 10 years. And the people, as you've indicated, have suffered uh, because they don't have a leader with his character. They don't have a leader with his, he's not a perfect leader, but he's got, he's got a hearty character. Um, the barons in the country are not united. They're, they're all kind of operating independently. Um, and everyday citizens are oppressed by greedy and unscrupulous leaders, um, uh, including um, as depicted in this film, the, 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 the church is not, uh, non-complicit in what's going on. Um, and, and into all of this, uh, this, this backdrop, we meet Russell Crowe, who plays Robin Longstride. Talk a little bit about Robin Longstride as portrayed by Russell Crowe in this film at the beginning when we first meet him. So he is just this, this common man. He is, um, being in the, the crusades with King Richard after 10 years at least as depicted here, they're back in France, um, which at the medieval times, I don't know what, 10, 11, through maybe 12, 1300s or so, uh, England fought over various parts of France. Um, not to get too in the weeds here, but uh, at the time we're talking about, um, in 1066, uh, William the Conqueror of Normandy in northern France conquered England. So you had the Normans and, uh, you know, the Saxons. Uh, Robin is of the sort of Saxon class, which was sort of uh, oppressed in a sense at the time. So um, King Richard, after 10 years in the crusade, he's in France and he's sort of one more siege away from returning to England. Right. At least that's what right. they say in the, in the movie. And so here's Robin Longstride. He's just a regular guy. He's an archer certainly in English history at this time for the next couple hundred years, the, uh, uh, the archers, the, the, the longbowmen uh, of England were sort of like the, uh, the ultimate weapon that other nations couldn't compete with, the ability to shoot these arrows from these massive bows, long distances, shoe armor. It's uh, certainly around English history. So he was uh, an archer, which you know, certainly had some respect in the military back then, but he was a common man. He wasn't this, um, this nobleman. So that's, that's the Robin Longstride of this version. And in some sense, in the original myths of Robin Hood, that is, in a sense, uh, back to the original myth, if you will. And, and he, has, he has a moment uh, early on in this movie with King Richard um, that, um, this is a very interesting, this is a great episode to be here, listener, because you're going to get a chance now to, um, and it's funny that we refer to things that don't show up in, in a final product as being on the cutting room floor. So Warwick had parts of his book, Crucible Leadership, Embrace Your Trials to Lead a Life of Significance, ended up on the cutting room floor. And now we're talking about movies where the idea of a cutting room floor actually does really exist because they would cut film out and they'd land on the cutting room floor. But there's a scene that helps explain um, 
the character, and by character, I mean the, the, the internal fortitude of Robin Longstride um, that you had originally put in your book, Crucible Leadership, to help people understand how you develop character, help people understand those uh, kinds of things. So unpack that a little bit. Let's you know kind of walk through that because it's a it's a fascinating look at um, how you speak truth to power. I think is the headline on that. Absolutely, Gary. So <clears throat> originally in my book, um, and in the current book, I have a couple chapters that deal with the organizational leadership. You know how you know how you organize a, a team of committed followers and that kind of thing. And so in the original version that was cut, you know, literally years ago, I had a scene from this 2010 uh, version of, uh, of Robin Hood. And in, in the movie, um, uh, we have uh, uh, King Richard the Lionheart, he's laying siege to this castle in France, and he's chatting with Sir Robert Loxley, uh, his right-hand man, and he's feeling a bit melancholy. They're in the tent, in his tent, and he's he's basically saying, um, you know, uh, Sir Robert Loxley is 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 saying, um, you know, they're going to rejoice when you when you come home. And King Richard says, well, you know, I'm not so sure. Uh, you know, my army knows better. The lion heart is a bit mangy. He feels like some of the luster <laughs> of his character is worn off a bit. A little bit of self awareness right. is a bit, yeah, sort of a bit melancholy. And so, you know, uh, Sir Robert Loxley says, "But everybody in the army idealizes you." And he says, "Oh, come on, you know." Uh, and so he says, "Let's see if we can find an honest man." He wants to see if he'll find an honest man in the English army. He will tell him the truth. That's what he's looking. And really, you know, credit to him, I suppose, for doing that. So somehow he comes alongside this common archer, uh, Robin Longstride. And uh, so basically, um, you know, there's a scene in which, uh, you know, he ends up meeting him. And, you know, if you've seen the movie, you'll know the context. Uh, but he starts out the relevant portion of our dialogue uh, by saying, um, you know, uh, are you honest enough to Robin Longstride to tell the king something he doesn't want to hear? What's your opinion of my crusade? Will God be pleased with my sacrifice? Now, that's about as tough a question as you're Absolutely. ever going to face. Yeah. What's your opinion of the crusade? And will God be pleased with my sacrifice? And so Robin takes a minute and he looks at the king and says, no, he won't. In other words, God won't be pleased with your sacrifice. I mean, in this day and age, as we said, kings had absolute power, which meant uh, the king could have killed him on the spot. There's no Supreme Court, no p appeals. I mean, you're literally taking your life in your own hands by saying that, and Robin did. And so obviously Richard says, well, why do you say that? And so Robin says, the massacre at Acre which was in, in the Middle East and in Palestine. And so um, Robin says, uh, you had us herd two and a half thousand Muslim men and women and children together and basically uh, killed them. And he said, um, you know, there was a woman that just looked at us, looked at me, and she just had pity in her eyes, not anger, but pity. And... Um, and he said, in that moment, Robin said, we would be godless, all of us godless. In other words, mm. they were betraying their faith. They were betraying God. They're doing everything morally and spiritually that was abhorrent and absolutely wrong. And um, so at that point, King Richard says, honest, brave, and naive. <laughs> Clearly, he was missing a few beats in his character. You know, the right. fact that he could even think that was justifiable, that terrific act. And so was, uh, so what happened to, uh, you would think he could have been executed at that point and end of movie after 15 minutes, but no, he was put in the stockades. You know, just, you know, if you've seen those at fairs where you stick your, your arms and legs or in stocks, that was, I mean, he could have been killed at least flogging would have been mild. And so that's sort of the end of that scene. It shows tremendous bravery, uh, on the part of, um, 
Rob, and in one final beat to the story that's not in the movie, uh, but that is, um, is, is really cool. In real life, King Richard does indeed die uh, at the siege in this castle in France. He gets, you know, shot uh, with a crossbow and he, he lays dying. And um, he wants to know which Frenchman, which French soldier has killed him. And turns out it's some, some French guy that, uh, I don't know, uh, supposedly in some other battle, King Richard's killed his, you know, father, brothers, you know, wars. Mm-hmm. Right. This stuff happens. And King Richard says, well, um, I understand that, uh, you know, I forgive you and you are to be free. In fact, I'll even give you some money. I mean, who, who gives their <laughs> person who kills them money? It makes no sense. So it's a great story and it's totally true. Sadly, after King Richard dies, some other mercenary kills, uh, kills this uh, young guy in pretty gruesome fashion. But, you know, it's, it's, you know, sometimes you can, forgiveness is good, but when you die, you know, it's not necessarily inherited by the next generation. But, right. right. Yeah, King Richard's an interesting guy, a flawed, a flawed hero, if you will. But as we'll see coming up, the now King John, as flawed as Richard was, and he was deeply flawed, uh, you know, King John was a whole nother level of evil. He truly was evil without any redemptive qualities whatsoever. Yeah. And we will get to uh, King John, who is who is King Richard's youngest brother, his his only surviving brother. But something you said as you were uh, 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 telling that story, Warwick, uh, really struck me. It's the first time it, uh, I, I thought about it this way, but you mentioned uh, Robert Loxley, uh, who is with King Richard when he's looking for a, a an honest man, right, uh, among his, his, his forces. And um, you mentioned that Sir Robert Loxley is the king's right-hand man. But... The king's right hand man is not that is not the honest man that the king's searching for. I mean, the king doesn't know. He asks someone, let's see if I can find an honest man. And the one, his right hand man who he asks is not an honest man because clearly, as you've explained, that massacre was something that a right hand man would know that was not the right thing to do. But again, he was he was perhaps more interested in holding on to power, holding on to authority than he was in doing the right thing. And that's a that's something that, that you've talked about in the book a lot. You talk about it. We talk about it on the show all the time. Surround yourself, leaders, with people who will tell you what you need to hear, not only what you want to hear. And Richard had surrounded himself with in Sir Robert Loxley with someone who told him what he he wanted to hear and didn't tell him what he didn't want to hear. Yeah, it's a fascinating point. I hadn't really thought about this, but I think another beat to the story of Sir Robert Loxley, I don't know that he was a bad person per se, but sometimes you're around this mythic hero like, uh, you know, King Richard, and you put blinders on. You see the heroic figure the one that the men cheer for and you forget the bad stuff because you don't want to take your hero off the pedestal. So for those of Mm -hmm. us, it's good to be, have heroes, but look at them with sober eyes. Don't think our heroes have no flaws because every, every person does. So if you're a follower, if you're a Sir Robert Loxley, don't idealize a hero so much that you can't even, you know, see the bad or, or their deficiency. So there's lessons for King Richard. There's also lessons for the Robert Loxley's of this world. You know, have a sober appraisal of your heroes because no hero in the world is perfect. Everybody yeah. has their flaws. And, and Robert Loxley was not willing to see that. He just saw the mythic hero figure, not the deeply flawed king that uh, Richard was. Yeah, and we find out more about Sir Robert Loxley, in fact, in, in one of the next uh, big scenes in the movie that has some 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 import for the uh, for crucible leadership. And that is um, he is wounded in um, the battle that um, commences that cost uh, uh, King Richard his life. He's wounded as well. And as he's laying dying, Robin Longstride is walking through among the injured men and Loxley stops. Um, Robin and says to him, he asks him to return his sword. He, he hands him his sword and says, please return this to my father back in England. Um, and 
again, speaking to perhaps the character of Robert Loxley having some holes in it, he had taken this sword from his father without letting his father know that. He, his father's also um, um, uh, Sir, um, I forget his name, Sir, what's his name? Walter, Sir Walter Loxley. And um, he wants Longstride to, to bring the sword back to his father. And uh, he, he begins the conversation, um, uh, Loxley does, with Robin by saying, you know, surely you have, you know, you know what it's, it's like to have a father who loves you. And he says, no, I, I, I don't know what that's like. Robin says he's, he, he says from his point of view, he's been told he, he feels his father abandoned him at age six. Um, and, but here's the interesting point. Robin agrees to bring that sword back to England and give it to Robert Loxley's dad. And I think the key crucible leadership truth there is we say a lot of the time you can't inherit a vision. And that is entirely true. You cannot inherit a vision. But at the same time, you don't necessarily inherit the kind of nobility that leads to character rather than position. Robin Longstride at that point in his life had no really memorable father influence. There was no, there was no heritage there that he felt that he heard. Um, And yet he built his own character on his own, doing his own thing by telling the King the truth in that time. And by this, this, this man, who's basically a a stranger he's fighting alongside who he knows is, 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 you know, of, of high station, but he says, yeah, I'll go back to England and I'm going to bring this sword back to your father because this is your dying wish. And Robin Longstride as a man of honor takes on that responsibility to execute that. And that's a, there's a lesson in that for us as well about the development of character. You can't inherit character from someone, but uh, what Robin didn't inherit from his own father in his own sort of upbringing, he certainly built on his own and taking on this responsibility for Robert Loxley. Yeah, it's such a good point, Gary. Uh, nobility of character, nobility of spirit, it's not something you inherit. It's sort of uh, intrinsic to who you are or something that you believe in, uh, develop. So this was an incredible scene where, as you say, Sir Robert Loxley uh, you know, lays dying, he's sort of murdered in an ambush. Um, and, uh, you know, he's got a few moments to live and he basically begs Robin Longstride, you know, I, I didn't leave my father in a good position. Uh, I took his sword from him. I didn't ask. Right. I want to be reconciled to my dad. What I did was wrong. You know, uh, I love my dad. He's a good man. Uh, please give the sword back to him. And he just begs him. And Robin Longstride says... I will do that. As soon as he said that, then uh, Sir Robert Loxley then then dies. He, he's right. at peace now, knowing mm-hmm. that there'll be, it was not just the soul will be given back to his father, but there's some sense of reconciliation. There's some sense of, uh, forgive me, father, you know, what I did was wrong. And so it's a great, not just returning uh, the sword, but in a sense, giving some measure of healing and restoration to the relationship between father and son, even after the death of the son. So it's it's an incredible thing that uh, Robin Longstride does. And as you say, it shows his character, his nobility of spirit, which right. is something that is irrespective of your place in life and birth. We can all have that nobility of character and spirit that Robin Longstride has. Yeah, I mean, there are people in this movie who are called Sir, right, who have the title of Sir, um, uh, who don't deserve it. Uh, who, who who don't have the character to match it. Um, Godfrey being the, uh, the the great example, the is he English? Is he French? What's he's playing both sides yeah. against the middle. Uh, he's he's sort of the the chief villain of the piece, but he's got nobility in some sense. Um, uh, you know, um, King John has nobility. Uh, in in a in a regal sort of um, aristocratic sense, but he doesn't have any of that that nobility of character that you talked about. No, I mean, just an interesting beat on that since we're talking about sirs and, and knights. Um, as listeners would know, uh, there were actually three knights in my family in a row mm. and not inherited. You can't inherit a knighthood, in, at least in the England, but 
uh, typically not in Australia, where my father was Sir Warwick Fairfax, his father was uh, Sir James Oswald Fairfax, and then before him, Sir James Redding Fairfax. And in theory, you're meant to be uh, given a knighthood for service to the community for doing things that are merit meritorious for your country. That's the theory. In practice, obviously, certainly back then, it wasn't always that case. But um, I think I might have mentioned this occasionally, but my father was knighted uh, while we were living in England when I was age about six. And so he actually got knighted in Buckingham Palace by mm. Queen Elizabeth II. And wow. at, I was in some, at age six, it seemed like some cavernous auditorium in the palace. I felt like I was like, an, <laughs> I don't know, sort of the, the bleachers, upper bleachers somewhere. But, uh, but you could see, just like in the movies, uh, my father kneeled. And she got mm. out the sword and, you know, puts the sword on both his shoulders, flat side. Obviously, you don't want to do the sharp yep. side. Otherwise, right. a knight's not going to be a knight too long. But uh, just, you know, if anybody's knighting people, flat side first, just, you know, tips here. <laughs> uh, Crucible leadership tip. <laughs> exactly. And then he, he, she says, arise, Sir Warwick. Just like in the movies. It, mm. it was pretty impressive. So, yeah, I like to think my father was... Uh, I uh, one of the one of the good nobles, one of the good knights, if you will. But uh, yeah, they weren't always that way, unfortunately. And uh, now that you've told that story, you have to tell the 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 funny thing that you mentioned in the book uh, that I've heard you uh, tell a couple times. Not everybody, I mean, people who aren't from England or Australia don't necessarily understand sirs and knights and lords and mm -hmm. all that stuff. And weren't there people sometimes that sort of misidentified your father by giving him a bit of a of a a royalty promotion of some sorts and explain yeah. that a little bit because it's just funny. Yeah, yeah. So um, after I graduated from high school in, I guess, 78, and then I uh, was going to Oxford and later in 79, fall 79, uh, we toured around the US for a couple months because I loved American history and that was where I wanted to go. My dad said, well, you got into Oxford, I'll take you anywhere you want to. And I wanted to go to the U.S., so we were traveling around, and as you say, people certainly back then didn't get all the differences, and they would call him Lord Fairfax. I mean, there were Lord Fairfax <laughs> is back in the day in Northern Virginia. Right. There was a Lord Fairfax that helped George Washington get his start, which is another story. Well, you know, a lord is a step up on being a knight, you know, and there's probably 15 different levels of knighthood, believe it or not. You know, knight of St. Right. George and the Garter, and goodness knows how many gradations there are. Um but yeah, when they called him Lord Fairfax, he didn't say, and actually, no, I'm just Sir Warwick. He just said nothing. <laughs> hey, you want to give I me a promotion? Said, yeah, <laughs> I wouldn't have said anything either. And a passing thing going by, that's fine. If, if that's what you want to believe, that's perfectly okay <laughs> yeah. with me. Back to the the sirs, though. Um, uh, so that sword that Sir Robert Loxley gives Robin to bring back to his father, Sir Walter Loxley, um, Robin is, 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 is messing with the uh, grip on it. He, he unwinds the grip and he, he sees a, uh, a slogan emblazoned in it. And it says this rise and rise again until lambs become lions later in the film. And it's pretty obvious when you hear that, but later in the film, we learn that that sort of just means never give up. And that's another key point in crucible leadership. We've done a, an entire podcast series on on resilience, about keeping bouncing back. Um, it's never too late to allow the crucibles of our lives to season and motivate us to a life of significance. Resilience is critical to not only recovering from a crucible, but living a life of significance afterwards. And that's a lesson that Robin Longstride, as this movie plays out, certainly learns, isn't it? It really is. And we'll see later on here in the movie, just the even the broader significance of that phrase, rise and rise again until lambs that come lines. Yes, absolutely. On one level, it means perseverance and you never give up. But I, on another level or an expanded level, the question is never give up about what? And basically what um, Robin Longstride's father is saying, your life should be in service of others. It should be, as we say in Crucible Leadership, a life of significance a life dedicated on purpose to serving others. What his dad is saying, 
you know, uh, rise and rise again until lambs become lions, until the common people have um, strength, have justice, would be another way right. of putting it. So never give up, but make sure your life's purpose, your life cause is a life of significance, a life on purpose dedicated to serving others. That was, uh, that was Robin's legacy. And um, that's, uh, as we'll see later, but that's, there's a lot of just deep meaning behind the words on the hilt of that sword. Yeah. And just so you know, I also wore a t-shirt with a lion on it today because <laughs> I knew that was coming. So um, awesome. <laughs> I always dress for the part in costume. So um, that was a pretty, uh, I mean, that was a pretty significant and uh, not heavy beat, but that was a, that was a, that was a definite, like important point to let sit with listeners and let's do that and, and, and do what they do at movies sometimes, when especially long epic movies, right? Uh, they take an intermission. Um, and, and so let's, uh, let's take an intermission in our discussion of Robin Hood and Robin Hoods as they appear uh, on film for our uh, series here, Lights, Cameras, Crucible, uh, uh, Crucibles. And let's talk about, you and I both have the, on the list of like, 75 Robin Hood um, versions that are out there. You and I both have favorites um, or, or some that, 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 that have more meaningful uh, to us uh, for you. Right. It's uh, it's well, explain what it was uh, for you. What's your kind of, kind of uh, one that really um, tugs at your heart. Well, in the sixties and seventies growing up, um, there was this black and white English TV series called Robin Hood. I think it ran in the UK uh, and in the US, maybe like 55, 56 through 59. It wasn't really a campy version, but it's, you know, back in those years, it certainly wasn't gritty. And it starred uh, Richard Green as um, Robin Hood. And every episode was him, um, you know, battling the Sheriff of Nottingham and uh, Prince John. Um, uh, you know, fighting for the oppressed. You had his love interest, uh, Maid Marian, who back then, as in the traditional version, she was um, uh, with either, you know, in the court of Prince John, Sheriff of Nottingham, and she would basically, you know, uh, get the scuttlebutt and pass it on to uh, Robin Hood. You know, hey, something's coming <laughs> down. You better, like, to the spy in the court, you know, that uh, nobody kind of knew. And yeah, it's not really a gritty Robin Hood, but it's... Um, it's just this classic series, a little bit like uh, the black and white version of Zorro uh, in the 60s with Guy Williams. Similar kind of TV series. You know, it, right. was, sem it was somewhat serious, but it wasn't gritty. And it was, yeah, you know, the underdog. I mean, Zorro is somewhat similar, you know, in, in that sense. An aristocrat who's, you know, fighting for the oppressed. Uh, somewhat similar beats. But yeah, it was just a fun series, and uh, I loved it. And um, yeah, had a, uh, and there's, had a go ahead. Well, I was going to say, and there's one of the reasons why you loved it. And '50s TV shows, in particular, were good at this. Um, uh, and that was the the series theme song. There is a uh, you know, I think of the Lone Ranger had a great theme song, and and uh, Zorro had a great theme song, and this particular Robin Hood series in the 50s had a great theme song, and we're going to let listeners hear it right now. the Glen, Robin Hood, Robin Hood, with his band of men, feared by the bad, loved by the good, Robin Hood, Robin Hood, Robin Hood. He called the greatest archers to a tavern on the green, they vowed to help the people of the king. They handled all the trouble on the English country scene and still found plenty of time to sing. Robin Hood, Robin Hood, right? 
riding through the glen. Robin Hood, Robin Hood, with his band of men, feared by the bad, loved by the good. Robin Hood, Robin Hood, Robin Hood. So did that does that bring back warm memories for you, Warwick, when you hear that theme song? Oh, it does. I love the uh, that opening scene where you see uh, Robin Hood pull back the bow and the swish of the arrow as it hits the tree. And then the ending theme tune, which was over the credits. And just that line, I won't sing it. You just heard the music. But it says, you know, Robin Hood, Robin Hood, riding through the glen, Robin Hood, Robin Hood with his band of men, feared by the bad, loved by the good, <laughs> Robin Hood, Robin Hood, Robin Hood. I mean, that's iconic, mythic stuff. It's no wonder that Robin Hood is this amazing figure, both in uh, the silver screen as well as in TV series. You know, it's such a, a wonderful character. Well, and my uh, special Robin Hood story is a little bit different. <laughs> it's the 1964 musical film robin and the seven hoods get it robin and the seven hoods it's like a play on words but it stars frank <laughs> sinatra and dean martin and sammy davis jr um it's one of their rat pack films and it i love it um and and i actually know a bit about it because i just wrote about it in my new book frank sinatra on the big screen uh the singer as uh as actor and filmmaker. Um, but the thing about that movie that was so great is it was a, it was a great conceit that they set up. Frank Sinatra who plays Robbo is, uh, and his merry men who are all his, his, his kind of associated hoods are good natured hoods, um, in, in prohibition era Chicago. Um, and this whole idea of, of taking from the rich and giving to the poor turns into kind of this PR stunt that Robin does where he he raises money for a charity to, to help um, to help disadvantaged kids. And at first it starts out as he just wants to do it as PR because, oh, look at Robbo, because he wants to he wants to get ahead of uh, uh, the guy Gisborne, played by Peter Falk, who just steals the movie. Um, he, he wants to make sure he can stay a step ahead of him in the in the battle for who's going to control the city's, um, uh, you know, illegal liquor. Um, not often a phrase you hear with uh, Robin Hood, by the way, illegal liquor, but that's true in Robin and the Seven Hoods. But there's a, but even in that movie, which is, which is a comedy, which is a musical, has some great moments in it. Um, it's got Sinatra singing, which is, is everything. Um, Bing Crosby plays Alan Adale, one of uh, mythically run a, one of Robin Hood's merry men. In this movie, uh, he comes alongside as kind of the accountant to uh, Robbo and his uh, to keep track of all these donations that are coming in for the kids. But there's a great scene in that movie that's musical as well uh, that speaks to this idea of of taking from those who have and giving to those who don't. And it's um, and about building character. Bing Crosby is sings a song um, to the, the these orphan children uh, as they're going to bed. It's like a bedtime, uh, not a lullaby, but a bedtime kind of okay, quick, go to bed now song. And it's it it it, it again. It speaks to the spirit of the character that we're talking about. And that song we'll play a little bit for uh, for you right here. It's called "Don't Be a Do Batter." We're taught and taught and taught To do the things we ought But all the things we're taught Can all add up to not Unless we really come to know There are just two ways to go Take it from me, don't be a do better -er. Do better, do better, you'll put your foot on that ladder that leads you to that place below. And every day you'll grow sadder, you'll feel sadder, you'll get madder. So use that self-same stepladder to climb the other way. 
scrapping and fighting, scratching and biting, cheating and acting. Selfish makes your heart like a part of the hardest hard shell. Shellfish, take it from me. Don't be a do better, a do better, a do better. Just step aboard that. Now all day I am going to be in my head singing, "Don't be a." Do better, uh, do better, because <laughs> that's uh, that's um, one of the only songs I've ever heard that has uh, a rhyme for step ladder in it. But there it is. Um, so there's our intermission. Intermission is over. Um, I just thought we'd do that to kind of give you a feel for one of the things we want this series to be right is informational and, and inspirational, but also fun. And hopefully Warwick uh, kind of uh, recalling his days of of watching Robin Hood on TV and me. Um, um, snapping my fingers to don't be a do bad or makes you smile. <laughs> um, going back to Robin Hood 2010 with Russell Crowe, um, he returns to England. He's got the sword. He's going to return it to, to uh, um, Sir Walter Loxley. And when he gets there, he meets Sir Walter um, and Sir Walter's daughter-in-law, Lady Marion. So this is Robert's wife, now widow, although she doesn't know it quite yet. And he ultimately pretends to be Sir Robert at the urging of Sir Walter. So Sir Walter says, okay, things are kind of unstable here. We need some stability. We need to, to have the people who are trying to, to oppress us to believe that my, that my son has come home. So Robin Longstride impersonates Robert Loxley when he's back in England because they need a man of grit and strength to help them survive kind of what's happening back home in England. Um, what's your, you know, as that beat plays out, how does that, how does that feel for you as Robin begins to step into a different identity than he's known? And I think that's a nice bridge to what ends up being his life of significance. You know, we have opportunities in life and um, in which you make a choice just to do follow our own path in the sense of do what we want to do but not in a good sense, just, hey, I want to do it because it's just about me and I don't care about anybody else. But we have opportunities in which we can decide, okay, is life more than me? Maybe I need to serve my fellow man, my fellow men and women. Mm -hmm. And in this case, Sir Walter Loxley, who's I think in his 80s at the time, he's pretty much blind. He knows that, uh, you know, without an heir, that everything will be taken away by, you know, King John and the Sheriff of Nottingham. Um, and so he says, look, for the moment, uh, my son is dead. I want you, you know, it's 10 years later in the Crusades. 10 years is a long time. You know, um, he was young when he left. Uh, I want you to play my son. And Robin does that not for his own glory. It's like uh, this old man, uh, you know, needs me. He's going to tell me more about my father and about the sword. It was, you know, he doesn't get the full story yet. And if I can help, uh, Sir Rob, you know, uh, Sir Walter Loxley and, uh, Marion, then, and, and the people in the village and around Nottingham, then I will. So it wasn't about glory. It was about right. serving other people and helping to fight oppression. Because if he doesn't take that up, it's going to mean all those people that live in that village are going to be ripe for oppression and persecution by King John and his henchmen. So this is what Robin's thinking. Okay, if I don't do this, bad things will happen to regular folks. So what am I going to do? He says, well, if I need to play this guy for the sake of protecting people, then, then I will. It, it is a noble decision in, in the best sense of that word. Right. And I... I love this discussion because we've used the word noble in different contexts several times. And it truly is. There's the nobility of position, which is not what Robin's after. There's the nobility of character that he exhibits over and over and over again. The next big scene, um, uh, you heard, listener, we, we played it at the outset of the show um, on the audio version of the show. The next big scene is when Robin does learn the truth about his own father. Um, uh, and it's told to him by Sir Walter. Uh, and it's a moment 
and I'll let Warwick give the details of it because uh, he understands this stuff a little better than I do. But it's in that moment, Robin receives something we talk about often at Crucible Leadership, and that is a legacy. Um, he learns some things that his father left behind, ideas and actions that ha- that can inspire that inspired citizens when his father was alive uh, and can inspire them again. So Warwick, what is it? Uh, unpack that clip that we played at the outset that uh, of what Sir Walter tells Robin and, and what he learns about his dad and why that's so meaningful. So in the clip, we see Robin with his father around the stone monument in the center of a town. And what he learns from Walter Loxley, from Sir Walter Loxley, is that Robin's father, he was a stonemason, which is a noble profession. You've got to be very skilled. But as noble as that profession is, he was more than a stonemason. He's told that his father was a visionary, a philosopher. In one sense, although they don't use that word, he was really a revolutionary in the best sense of that word. And so um, when he wrote those words, rise and rise again until lambs become lions on that stone, he was really talking about the concept of freedom, of, of liberty, is what he was really talking about. And it says, you know, um, uh, Sir Walter Loxley says, we took up his call for the rights from baron to serf. In other words, from, from noble to the, you know, just the regular person to, to anybody. And... Um, you know, one of the things that uh, Robin's father was doing was organizing a charter. And there were names on that charter with people who really wanted to fight uh, that everybody would have rights, would have liberty. Right. And um, he was executed because Robin's father would not give up the names on that charter. You know, one of them uh, was indeed Sir Walter Loxley. Right. And, and some other characters that we see. And that's important to say, because we said earlier, Robin believed for his whole adult life uh, and his his youthful life after age six, he believed his father abandoned him. And this is one of the one of the things that's going on in this scene is is he realizes not only did his father not abandon him, but his father lived a noble life in the sense of noble character. Right. Absolutely. You know, and we always talk about you can't inherit a legacy. Uh, this is one exception in which Robin, in a sense, did. We would see that this legacy of fighting for the oppressed, of fighting for liberty, you know, even before Robin knew his father's full legacy, that's who he was. You know, right. In some sense, I don't know if it was inherited or it was just innate or learnt, but in this sense, it's one thing inheriting some family business legacy but a legacy in terms of standing up for the oppressed and for freedom and liberty, that's a powerful legacy. It's, it's, that would be a harder thing to say, well, okay, dad, mom, I know you are for legacy, you are for liberty and freedom, but uh, I'm not really into that. It really, in a right. sense, his father's legacy was a legacy of significance, of living exactly. a life on purpose, so helping others. All of us, if we are so blessed to have that legacy from our parents, that's a legacy, and that may mean different things for us, but that legacy of serving others, uh, a life of significance, and that was the legacy inherited, which I'm sure as he fully understood it, I'm sure it meant the world to Robin. My dad, my dad was a great man. He right. died uh, to keep the names of those who wanted to fight for freedom and for rights out of the hands of, you know, the the wicked rulers at the time. So that's that's just so powerful, that legacy that Robin realized. God, my, my dad was a revolutionary, a philosopher, a visionary, a champion of the oppressed. That's my dad? He'd had no yeah. clue before. I mean, that right. just is an incredible scene. And to the point of whether he inherited the legacy, you can't inherit a vision, you can't inherit a legacy. I don't know that he inherited it as much as he continued it, meaning he'd already, as you just indicated, and, and and we've been talking about Robin had already been living a life of significance. He's been, his arrow, no pun intended, was pointed toward a life of significance. So when he learns this, that gives him a chance to adopt 
that thing that his father is doing and add that to, to his quiver. Again, I'm just, I keep making puns about arrows, but he gets to add that aspect of what his father was doing to the quiver that he has of his life of significance and for helping people. Um, and there was, as he picked up that mantle that his father had established and that was interrupted by his being murdered, um, as he picks up that mantle, Warwick, there's something pretty significant that happens uh, in the movie and then just in the kind of in the arc of of history. Um, unpack that a little bit for listeners. Yeah, I mean, there's um, a great scene where sort of the origin of the Magna Carta uh, happens, which is uh, has been an inspiration for Britain and indeed the United States, this concept of liberty that happened in the Magna Carta, which we see a, a bit in this movie. And so, you know, what happens after, you know, Robin hears about his heritage, uh, at some point after that from, from Sir Walter Loxley, um, Basically, uh, Sir Walter Loxley has been sent a message that the northern barons are gathering. Godfrey, we see in the movie, is plotting to create a civil war so that the northern barons will attack King John a while. They're at each other's throats in some massive for civil war. Along will come, I believe, it's King Philip of France and invade England and take it over. So this is all part of a plot, uh, deliberately. Uh, so... Um, so basically, Walter is too old, and so he sends Robin in his place to represent him. Um, and uh, in fact, he says to Robin, cometh the hour, cometh the man, which I'm sure we've all heard before, a great phrase. So here he goes to, in the movie, uh, Barnsdale, and um, he passes that very monument that we saw in that clip. It's actually in the town where they're going to have this discussion about the Magna Carta and the Charter, at least in the movie anyway. So he sees that, and it's again, he's sort of hit between the eyes, thunderstruck, if you will. It's like, wow, I'm going to this big meeting, and those words are ringing in my ears, rise and rise again until lambs have become lions. And so um, then Robin gives this unbelievable speech in which he says in front of King John and the other nobles, can I say something? Well, they think of him as, you know, uh, Sir Robert of Loxley. They don't really know who right. he is. So right. he's, he's a noble every noble has the right to speak in this meeting. And so he says uh, to the people and the king the following. He says, if you're trying to build for the future, you must set your foundation strong. The laws of this land enslave people to its king, a king who demands loyalty but offers nothing in return. I have mastered Palestine and back, and I know in tyranny lies only failure. You build a country like you build a cathedral from the ground up, empower every man, and you, the king, will gain strength. If your majesty were to offer justice in the form of a charter of liberties, allow every man to forage for his hearth, to be saved from conviction without cause, or prison without charge, to work, eat, you know, uh, work in the sweat of your brow, to be as merry as you can, as you can. the king will be great, not only will he receive the loyalty of his people, but their love as well. And, you know, King John kind of scoffs at this a bit um, about that whole thing. Uh, but, um, you know, eventually Robin says, what would have your majesty is, is liberty, liberty by law. Well, at that point, uh, King jo John is between a rock and a hard place. He knows the French are about to attack. He knows if the nobles are divided, he'll lose. So in the movie, he grudgingly says, sure, I'll sign this charter. And, um, you know, uh, or I'll sign the charter once we win. Later in the movie, we find he, he rips it up. In, in real life, it is true that the Magna Carta, which was in Runnymede, south of England near Windsor, uh, was something that was drawn up that really did proclaim uh, rights it's grown to mythic proportions uh, later on, and certainly in the eyes of the founders of the United States, one of their inspirations was the Magna Carta. And as they saw it, which is a little bit mythic, about, like Robin Hood, they saw the Magna Carta as guaranteeing the rights to every person uh, to you know, trial by jury. So a little bit expanded, perhaps. Originally, it was more about the rights of nobles, but it took on a mythic proportions. So in a sense, back to Robin um, Longstreet, 
Here he gives this speech, and really he is inheriting his father's mantle about the Charter and now the Mag- Magna Carta. It's, it's almost the same legacy in a sense. And here he is, at least in this mythic um, portrayal, he's in this key moment where the Magna Carta is drawn up that will influence democracies around the world for centuries, including influencing the very forming of the United States. So, you know, talk about a legacy of significance. You know, you have a, you're at a place where you're advocating for liberty and freedom against tyranny that will affect countries all over the world uh, for hundreds of years and for generations. I mean, that's, not many of us will have that kind of life of significance. Uh, But, you know, Robin wasn't thinking that. He was thinking, look, you know, if we don't do something, France is going to conquer this country. We've got to unite people, and I want to fight for freedom and liberty. So he's not thinking about the big legacy picture. He's just thinking, look, you know, something needs to be done here. We need to be united, and we need to use this opportunity to fight for freedom and liberty. It's an incredible scene. We talk a lot at beyond the crucible and crucible leadership about the power of just taking one small step toward your goal. And as I think back over what we've just talked about for the last hour or so, um, Robin Longstride's life that we've just unpacked is a series of one small steps, right? Step one, he tells King Richard the truth about uh, what he feels about the crusades. He has the courage to do that where no one else does. Uh, Step two, he agrees, even though he doesn't really know Robert Loxley, to take the sword that Robert Loxley had taken from his father and caused some some estrangement there. He agrees to take that back to England and give it to his father. Um, He steps into um, the role of Robert Loxley when Robert Loxley's father asks him to do so to help bring some stability and some strength to what is turning into a very bad situation for the people of England when he gets back there. Um, He takes this small step of speaking in the meeting um, uh, where they're talking about this charter. Um, And then he takes, um, for him was probably a small step, but not a small step in the, in the movie and that he takes a leading role Uh, The next step he takes toward his life of significance is a leading role in the the, um, turning away of the um, French forces when they they try to lay siege to England and ultimately preserving the 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 freedom, the the uh, the freedom of England not to be under France's rule. Um, He that's again, another step he took to do that by fighting on the front lines to get that accomplished. Um, fascinating, isn't it? How his life is a series, what we just talked about is a series of, of small steps that lead to a life of significance. It really is. I mean, that's one of the last scenes of the movie, the battle scenes. It's at an epic when um, all the forces in England uh, unite. The nobles may not like King John, but they don't want to be uh, you know, overtaken by France. So, you know, the right. greater enemy is the important one. And they're probably skeptical that John will live up to the charter, but one lives in hope. Uh, but meanwhile, you know, the, the greater enemy is France. So here they are, they come to this cliff, and um, there's this great scene where one of the uh, key honorable figures in uh, English nobility, a man by the name of Marshall, um, who's, you know, fighting for justice, uh, he leads the cavalry on the beach, and uh, Robin leaves the archers on the cliff, and the archers rain down you know, all of these uh, arrows on the French forces. And as the French king is in his ship about to, uh, you know, uh, send his forces in, he says, well, this doesn't look like a country at (laughs) war with itself. This looks like you're united. I mean, as French would say, you know, mon Dieu, which is my God. I don't know if he says that in the movie, but it's the kind of thing a Frenchman would say at that point. It's like, uh (laughs) uh-oh, would be the rough English translation. I'm in trouble. Uh, but, you know, obviously, as you see the movie, the English forces win. They turn back the French. The evil uh, English slash Frenchman, uh, henchman uh, Godfrey, gets killed by an arrow in an incredible shot by, uh, by Robin. But uh, 
one of the sad things as we sort of wind up uh, the movie is um, yeah, I think King John maybe asked Marshall this good noble, you know, who are they cheering for? And it's like they're cheering for Robin. You know, he's, I don't know if everybody realized, he's just a regular guy. He's a regular right. guy that helps have a massive role in saving England from the French. Well, as we'll see, uh, King John is not a noble of character. And he no. doesn't like it when the person he discovers to be this regular guy uh, is cheered for. So, yes, the adulation that the troops give Robin, as we'll see, proved to be his undoing. No fault of Robin's, but King John is not one to play second fiddle, unfortunately. No. And he, uh, as you are, have indicated, he he tears up the charter um, and he declares Robin an outlaw. And the and what's beautiful about that from the perspective of what we've been talking about in terms of the Robin Hood legend is this truly has been an origin story. You realize at that moment when um, he wants to the, the sheriff of Nottingham is going to hang a, a sign, you know, saying that Robin's an outlaw. Um, uh, and he, he asks, you know, I need a nail. Next thing that happens, an arrow splits his <laughs> fingers. It doesn't go through his fingers, but it like goes in between his fingers and nails it to the tree. And that is right. The launching of Robin hood as this figure who will, who will take from the comfortable and the oppressors and give to the oppressed. And that's when you kind of realize as a movie goer, it was kind of a fun scene. It's like, Oh, what I've been watching was a complete origin story, just like how Spider-Man <laughs> becomes Spider-Man or Batman becomes right. Batman. It's a film. It, it's a movie length uh, origin story, backstory that tells how Robin Hood becomes Robin Hood. And I think that's a, uh, is a, is a great, and there's lots of lessons to learn along the way that we can, we can kind of put in our pockets as we begin to move out from our origin story and to pursue our life of significance, right? Absolutely. What's fascinating about this ending of the Robin Hood movie with Russell Crowe is it's not really a happy ending. It's right. like, he helps to, you know, create what would become the Magna Carta. It was ripped up at the moment, but it did come to live on in English history and world history. Um, he becomes an outlaw. Why? Well, because he helped save his country. And uh, King John didn't like the adulation. He was jealous. And so because of all the good he did, it the good he did proved his undoing. So one of the lessons in life is sometimes when you do good, other people get jealous and they don't like it. So just because you live a life of significance and want to defend the oppressed and fight for liberty, it doesn't always work out well. You know, there's not always a happy ending. Right. In this sense, it's not a happy ending. But my sense is we see the closing scenes of the movie where Robin is in what one would assume is Sherwood Forest with Marion. They're happy, you know, with the outlaws and protecting the oppressed. I doubt that they bear a grudge, but it's sort of a, a sad uh, ending, obviously in the traditional one, like a 1938 version of Robin Hood with Errol Flynn. Um, you know, uh, King uh, Richard comes back uh, from the Crusades and all is well. And uh, you know, he gets the girl and marry and he gets his titles back and all is good. Well, you know, life isn't always like a fairy tale. And in some senses, is this more realistic? Maybe. Uh, but... Um, he lives his life of significance. He lives his convictions, whether or not it fame or fortune comes to him. And in the end, fame and fortune do not come to him. He right. is uh, on the run from you know the evil uh, King John. But um, yet, I'm sure if you asked him, do you regret what you did? Do you regret exactly. saving England from the French? Right. Do you regret you know upholding your father's charter? Do you regret fighting for liberty and freedom? He'd, he'd say no. You know. I may die, but I will have lived a life that I feel like I and those who know me can be proud of. So yeah, it's a great story. And in the context of this series, Lights, Camera, Crucibles, where we're talking about movie heroes, it's not an uncommon ending to a story, right? Think of Spider-Man, who we're going to talk about next week. Spider-Man is a character who a lot of people think especially the publisher of the Daily Bugle, J. Jonah Jameson, think 
thinks he's a he's a villain, doesn't think he's a good guy. The Hulk isn't thought of as a as a hero. A lot of the heroes that we have talked about and we'll talk about Batman. He's a vigilante. He's a he's a bad guy. Um, there is a little bit of that. And I think um, f- from the perspective of Robin Hood or some of these other heroes that I've just talked about, that idea of being not a happy ending, not, you know, being able to rest. I think that fuels them to continue their life of significance in some way. And they probably look at that as right. I mean, what a Robin's Robin Hood's life of significance is to defend the oppressed. And when you defend the oppressed, those doing the oppressing are going to be after you. So I think he probably welcomes that in some way, right. That allows him to keep, keep on keeping on in his life of significance. So as we wrap up here, Warwick, what's the last, um, you know, of all the things that we've talked about, pull the balloon strings together and let, uh, let listeners know what's the, what's the chief learning maybe from Robin Hood? Well, there's probably a couple, but I love the fact that Robin is living his father's legacy, but yet it's his own legacy of, uh, you know, fighting for the oppressed, fighting for the rights of men and women, for, for liberty, equality, um, for, uh, you know, just um, giving people, uh, whether they be noble or serf, as, as his father puts it, uh, equal rights. Uh, that's, a, that's when you live your whole life and that's your life of significance, it, in a sense, it doesn't get any better than that. You know, uh, that's yeah. a wonderful legacy to be living. But realize as you live your life of significance, you know, sometimes things will go well for you, but sometimes it won't lead to fame and fortune, nor will you always be seen as the hero. You know, sometimes right. you'll be vilified. Uh, certainly the oppressed liked Robin Hood, but the nobility, who he was upsetting the apple cart, not so much. And so, you know, you've got to live your life as significance, not so much because of what other people think, but what you think in your inner core what lines up with your own spirituality and faith and values. So a life of significance is not a popularity contest. It's, you know, it's meant to be something that's rooted in your inner values, be it fame, fortune, be it approval or condemnation. It's living what you believe in the service of a greater cause and service of others. That's what a life of significance should be. And really Robin Hood models that so well. I'd say it's that the plane has landed, but we've been talking about arrow. So the arrow has found its mark, Warwick. <laughs> we have uh, we have uh, wrapped another episode of Beyond the Crucible's special summer series, Lights, Camera, Crucibles. And next week, I've said it a couple of times already, but next week, if you want to do like a little homework, not homework, a little bit of fun, watch a movie with your family, enjoy it. We're going to be talking about Spider-Man next week. And the movie that we're going to drill in on most is the first one with Tobey Maguire, um, which was just called The Amazing, uh, it was was just called Spider-Man. So that's the one that we're going to drill in, but there's a lot of iterations to talk about. So any, really any Spider-Man movie you want to pop in, um, we're probably going to be able to uh, touch on that when we have our conversation. So until that time happens next week, listener, thank you for spending time with us um, uh, on this episode. And please remember that we do understand how painful crucible experiences are. We know it's difficult. We know it can knock the wind out of your sails and it can change the trajectory of your life. But we also know that crucibles aren't the end of your story. When you learn the lessons of them, when you apply those lessons as you move forward to a life of significance, that journey can take you to the greatest chapter of the greatest story of your life. Why? Because where it leads you to is a life of significance.